Man, oh man. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Man, I feel like the whole family's here and I needed y'all here today. So this is all about me and y'all being here. So that's great. So good to see y'all. Hi out there in La La Land. Hope y'all are doing well. Um, we have special things on special things this morning, so we're just going to keep them going. I'm trying to think of the best way to do this and set it up. Um, we have a special, well, she's going to come up here and we're going to talk about a little story uh, and experience that my oldest daughter had. Olivia, can you come up here real quick, baby? Yeah. All right. This is Olivia Walker. She's 13 years old. And uh, let's see, what's the best way to do this? So our family uh, been going through some rough times and tough situations. And uh, Olivia has been going to school. And she was going home pretty often just with a stomach ache, just hurting, hurting, hurting. Uh, just a lot of, of, of worries or anxieties, things like that. And so, anyway, to tell the story of this particular day, uh, she went to school in the morning, and stomach was really bothering her, so she went home. And she's at home, and uh, I texted her. I was at Schlotzky's. Y'all know what Schlotzky's is. Yep. Delicious sandwich. Always get the ranch on the side. Uh, just dip that sandwich in, but that's not what this is about. What was I saying? Um, okay, so I, was eating, I, I texted her. I said, how you feeling? And she said, I'm feeling bad. I was like, okay, and so I'm like, man, I might need to go home and check on her or something like that. And so all of a sudden, about 20 minutes later, <laughs> she calls me, and she's bawling crying, like just convulsive crying. And, of course, I'm sitting there going, what, baby, what, baby? I'm thinking, I got to get home, I got to get home. She says, Daddy, she says, Daddy, I was praying, and I was laying on the bed, and God sat on the end of the bed, on the edge of the bed. So, the way that she explained it to me, uh, oh, sorry, sorry about that. You sit there, Liv. Can you sit there? And so she, she was sitting there, and she said, Daddy, I was praying the longest prayer I've ever prayed. And she was closing her eyes and uh, going through all the people on her heart, from mommy to daddy to her friends and all that kind of stuff. And she sitting there, and she she um, she says amen, and she's open her open her eyes, and this is the edge of the bed, so she's over that way. She opened her eyes, and Jesus was sitting right here, and just looked at her and smiled. And then she said, "I guess time froze. This is one of those shack situations, you know what I mean?" She said that they had a that he spoke to her for what seemed like an hour going through every person in her life, talking about how much he loves each and every one of them. And also talking about her friends. And he, it is neat because she said, he talked about my friends as though he was part of the friend group. Like it was so natural. It wasn't like, you know, so-and-so and their last name that lives at this address. It was very specific and just going through each of them. And of course, she said that he spent a lot of time uh, talking about how much he loves that one over there, too. Uh, so it was very sweet. And so at the end of it, and of course, uh, everybody asks, what did he look like, right? What did he look like? That's the first thing that pops in your head. And it's like, uh, she said, you know, I didn't even really pay attention to that. And, uh, but you know it's Jesus, you just know, right? And he's sitting at the edge of the bed and tells her how much uh, he loves each and every one of the people that she loves. <laughs> and then goes on to, um, to say, basically, go and tell them how I feel about them. Just share with them how much I love them. So she's sitting there. Of course, she's like blown away, right? Yeah. She, and he gets up. He walks out of the, be uh, the bedroom, and she hears the front door open and close. Boom. And so we, we talk about like uh, in the resurrection, Jesus came and he ate fish. You know, it was, he was real. He was real. And it was just a confirmation that this is not some sort of mind game. This is not some sort of hallucination. And it's so amazing. Uh, if you want to go sit back down over there, you can sit there, baby, whatever. Um, it's funny, because <clears throat> the night before, I was praying, 
And I was going, Jesus, where are you? <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. I'm sitting there, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And it's like the next day, it's like, hey, Jack, I'm sitting on the edge of your bed. I'm right there in the midst of... That's right. That's absolutely. So if y'all have any prayer requests, I'd take them to Olivia. She has, She's really tight with uh, our Savior. So that I wanted to share that. I wanted to share that with y'all this morning. So, um, okay. So good. So I, I don't know how long this is going to last or um, what I'm, I never really know. Well, y'all know, I really don't know where I'm going or what I'm doing, but um, yes, thank you, baby. Thank you. Um, so the, the title to this sharing or message is, it's, it is, uh, it goes, is that a typo? So that's the title of my message because I believe that I have found a typo in the scripture. I know it's been around for thousands and thousands of years, but I believe that I found a typo. It's got to be a typo. Um, and I, I take us to uh, Ecclesiastes 7 3. Ecclesiastes 7 3. This is how it goes um, it says, Sorrow is better than laughter. For when a face is sad, a heart may be happy. Sounds like a typo, right? To me, that's like, how in the world is sorrow possibly better than laughter? Um, so growing up, I, um, I was very much into humor. I still am. I believe that's one of my spiritual gifts. Uh, humor. Humor, I think it's under one of the uh, redemptive gifts in the Bible. Uh, Anyway, so growing up in, in high school, I was the class clown of 02. I got the plaque to prove it. It's at the house. So if any of y'all need proof, I do have that proof. Um, and I realized that in school, if you can somehow make the teacher laugh, then you could never get in trouble. That is, that is the key. And I tell people about that too, as far as your boss or whatever. You'll never get in trouble as long as you can make the teacher laugh, as long as you can make your boss laugh. I only got kicked out of class three times. I feel like that was a pretty, pretty good run. Uh, only three times. Only three times. They were all coaches, so they were a little bit extra. Anyway, so I came across this scripture, and I am not the most comfortable person with negative emotions, with sadness. I do not do sadness well. I don't. Um, and I certainly do not do sorrow well. And when you're caught in between wanting to be happy or joyful or whatever version of joy you believe that to be, and the aches of the heart and sadness, you get caught in this horrible place called anxiety, right? You're pulled back and forth. It's like you don't want to go there and you're being dragged over to this one side. And all you want to do is feel that joy, that, that happiness, that, 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 ex that, that those things that make us look forward to the day, right? And so I, um, coming across this uh, scripture, began to open my eyes as to what, what is to this sorrow thing, right? What is sadness really about? What is really going on? Because we know that in the cross, we, we, that Jesus comes and he bears our, our sorrow, right? Mm -hmm. And we have this idea that being in Christ, all of a sudden, I have access to a zap. Boom! Right, I can somehow get rid of this junk inside of me just like that. And then if it's not gone, then you start to question, well, did I say the right words or am I really in Christ at all? Do I have this message right? Because you still feel that pain. And so understanding those emotions, understanding those experiences in light of really what took place in the cross um, has been quite the uh, awakening for me. Um, so look at joy. Joy is not floating around in the stratosphere, right? Um, it's not something disconnected to our real human life. Joy is not a denial of circumstances or situations or hardships. Um, or it wouldn't say that the joy of the Lord is my strength, right? What would be, this, what would be the purpose for strength if it was just, there was no, nothing to be strong for or strong through. It's incarnational. 
every gift of the Spirit, every spiritual blessing in heavenly places is incarnational. Yeah. That means it's worked out within our real human life. It's not an escape from our life. It's a working it out in it. So, um, I uh, have you ever seen... <laughs> I get a lot of my theology from cartoons. Um, there's a movie called Inside Out. Yeah. Have you ever seen that movie Inside Out? Um, that is your assignment. If you have not done it, please go watch that cartoon uh, when you go home. It's an animated film, and it's about this little girl. She moves, her family moves from one place to another. She loses all her friends. She's no longer uh, connected with her school, her home. And then half of the stuff the movers didn't bring to her new home. And she's sitting there. And this it, basically, it's all about these emotions in her head, right? And so you have joy. You have anger. You have disgust. You have fear. And um, maybe embarrassment. Sadness. And sadness. And so these emotions are all in the head. And the leader, of course, is joy. You know, joy is running the show because why not? Like that's the feeling that we all want to feel. That's what, uh, that's what she's meant to feel is joy. But she had this tremendous loss. Well, the whole thing, it starts out as joy is trying to manage the circumstances, right? Manage the situation. We got to find the, the light in all this. We have to find the joy in this. And she draws a circle, and this is like at a, uh, inside this little girl's head. It's kind of got like this uh, control board uh -huh. and each emotion, you know, would go up to the control board and, and basically be <laughs> the appropriate emotion for the circumstance. Well, sadness was made to stand way over here. There's a circle. Oh, there I am. there's a circle. <laughs> there's a circle drawn over here by joy that said sadness. You have to stay there. And so this whole movie things continue to fall apart more and more and more. Everything that joy tries to do to try to fix it, or happiness really, it tries to fix it, another thing falls apart. Another thing falls apart. And it is crazy. Uh, by the end of it, joy finally gave up because it, was, it came down to this little girl's, you know what, I'm going to run away and go back to where I live. And she gets on a bus to go do that. And so as to escape what is current to get back to what was. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so that's what she wanted to do. So at the end of it, sadness finally is able to take control of the emotions. And it was such a revelation to me. It's so important to understand that sadness is so valuable. Mm -hmm. And the reason sadness is so valuable is because it affirms something went wrong. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. That is who Jesus yeah. is. He's the affirmation to us that what we go through is real and it really hurts. And when we don't go there and allow that sadness to, to, to do what it's called to do, then we don't have that affirmation that's needed that I shouldn't have been wounded. I shouldn't have been hurt. You bleed. It, it, I'm, I'm glad that we bleed because if we didn't bleed, we wouldn't know we were cut. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If we didn't have pain, then we wouldn't know that we've been stabbed, that we've been injured. And that sadness is so valuable. And this is part of the reason why. 2 Corinthians 7.10. So, um, 7.10. Uh, a couple weeks ago, Andrew talked about this. And he went off into some deep, deep territory. Um, and it was really, really good. And so I'm kind of piggybacking, piggy, piggybacking off of him. Yeah, that's the yep. right word. So this is what the, it says. It says, uh, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret, mm -hmm. leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Mm -hmm. So this is a real tongue twister. The will of God, which we've talked about the will of God. It's not getting up in the morning and going, if I go to HEB and I get the front parking spot, it was the will of God. You know what I mean? That's not what we're talking about. When we look at the will of God, read Ephesians 1 every day. 
I mean, that is the will of God, the good pleasure of the Father, that we're included in the life that the Father, Son, and Spirit share, that dance of the Trinity. And that's not disconnected from our everyday life, right? So that is the will of God. You know that today that is the will of God, that you be blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, in the position, in the place that you live in relationship with others. So when we're talking about the sorrow that's according to that will, it produces which that word produce means to work out. It means to trade. So to trade, to make gains by trading. So there is a trading going on in the midst of that sorrow. And we know what that trading is, right? It is is, we are in Christ and there's something going on uh, in that moment, in that relationship that we share with Him. It produces repentance. And we know that that's not being really, really sorry. Like get that out of y'all's head. Repentance is not being really, really sorry. Repentance is metanoia. It's radical change of mind, not paranoia. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see? It's the same. It's the same thing. Para means to stand beside, no, beside the mind. Metanoia is a radical change within the mind. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So a lot of times when we, we get this Gnostic idea of how to live the Christian life, we disconnect from the reality of yeah. our situation in our life. That's paranoia. That's a, that causes, we're looking out, we're looking at ourselves, and we're in denial of the circumstances, the situation, and that's where relationship, of course, breaks down because people are looking at you like you're crazy. You know what I mean? You, you, you're in denial of what's going on in the real world. And last time I spoke, we talked about how His grace is sufficient for what's real. Yeah. Not for what's fake. Yeah. Right? You do not have the grace for what doesn't exist. Ooh. Right? And so in that metanoia, it says that it produces a radical change of mind without regret. Well, that word it means without repentance. So there's the tongue twister. Ooh. It produces repentance without repentance. It, re- it produces a change of mind without a change of mind. Also, a better way to look at it, it's irrevocable. That is how powerful that when you're talking about being able to enter in to that, that, that the will of the Father into that affirmation of how you feel, the affirmation of your emotions, there is a repentance, there's a metanoia that takes place there like none other. Because there's an affirmation of everything that you've gone through, and that's where Jesus meets us. He doesn't meet us disconnected from that. You know, we talked about last time, you know, Lazarus dies, and he weeps with Mary and Martha and everybody else. He's going to resurrect in about five minutes. But yet he's mourning with them. He joins them where they are at. That's incredible to me. That's incredible. And we so try to escape those uh, negative emotions and those pains um, without taking, allowing ourselves to understand why, right? We always go for the cheap emotions. Anger is a cheap emotion, y'all. It's a really cheap one. It's easy, right? Anger is easy because instead of actually digging down to why is it that I feel this way? Why is it that I hurt this way? We go to, this isn't right. You know what I mean? I'm going to make someone pay. Someone's to blame. And so we, those are, that's such cheap emotion instead of digging deeper. And then, of course, it says without regret, which means without, uh, uh, it's, it's irrevocable. So a change of mind that is irrevocable leading to salvation. And, of course, that's soteria. Soteria is this beautiful Greek word. And if you ever look it up in the Greek dictionary, it goes on and on and on. It's like this big, one of my favorite descriptions of that word is deliverance from the molestation of your enemy. Deliverance from the molestation of your enemy. That's good, right? I love that. And what is the molestation of our enemy in this? That anxiety. Yeah. That fear. That constant. It's they they provide an example. When you're looking at the molestation of your enemy, it's like gnats flying around your head. You know, you're swatting at them all the time. You're swatting at them. We had a bunch of gnats come in. To our uh, at our property the other day, and they were just biting us up. <laughs> and Olivia were trying to have a conversation, and it was like boom, boom, boom. And it's like that's that word, that's that molestation of the enemy, and that's deliverance from that, um, from that anxiety. So, 
growing up, and this is for all the dudes, the dudes out there, us guys. <laughs> growing up, uh, I grew up around what I'd consider manly men, I guess. And um, there are expectations on us guys a lot of the time that come down to you just bear it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You just bear it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter. There's, don't cry about it. Just handle it, right? Yeah. Have you all heard that? That's what yeah. we've heard. Uh, um, get over it. Get over it. Uh, don't be sad, right? Not allowed to be sad. You got to be strong enough. You got to be powerful enough. Those are the expectations that are a lot of times placed on us from generation to generation to generation. And what that creates is a sadness that we never are able to go to to really become everything that we're meant to be, not only as men, but as people, right? Yeah. To go down to the depths of those wounds and those, those hurts to be able to truly heal. And so I grew up like that. And so he automatically, whether my dad wanted that to be an expectation on me, it was an expectation on me. Right. And so dealing with life's problems when you can't handle it or whatever, you have to escape and cope with it some way or another. I'm not allowed to be sad. So what do I do? I have to rise to a place or lower myself, however you want to say it, to cope with those things by creating a reality that's not real. Yeah. I have to yeah. in order to cope with it. And so everything's OK. Everything's going to be OK. And you just kind of in denial of the fact that you're like sitting in a swamp or something. And you continue to try to build or build this reality that doesn't exist. And the people around us, the people that love us the most are going, well, what happened? Like, what, this is not the reality. That's not what is going on. You're able to feel the pain. You're able to come and, 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 and learn from it and discover from it. And it's twofold because that sorrow not only from wounds that we've received from others, but it's amazing that in every, in a sorrow that was created by you, let's say a decision you made, a wound that you created in relationship, I will tell you what that metanoia does is it goes to the source of the wound. That's what's so beautiful. Yeah, That's what yeah. really changes your mind is when you begin to find the source of why am I bleeding out here? And you go down and you actually see where that wound comes from. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And in adulthood, we're always trying to finish childhood, right? <laughs> we're trying to finish, finish that childhood. What that means is that there's things, there's things in each of our childhoods that we were not meant to experience or that we were meant to experience that we didn't, mm. right? Yeah. And so the... In, in, in our adulthood, finishing that, that is finishing that in the dance of the Trinity, those missing sections. And what happens is we often put that on other people to meet those, to finish childhood. So I'm going to use you to finish my childhood. I'm going to find those needs that I were meant, that were meant to be met back then. I'm going to use you to meet those needs. Instead, what we're talking about here, when Jesus uh, bore our grief, our sorrow, he joined into the human race as the affirmation of every single thing that we feel. But there's something different. There's something different between what he does and what the sorrow of the world has, which leads to death. Right, So he climbs inside of all of our brokenness. He climbs inside of that unique sorrow, that unique grief that we have, and there is a change that takes place. He doesn't zap us, y'all. The Scripture does not say that he takes our mourning and throws it in the trash can and then gives us dancing. Right? It doesn't say that. It says he turns our mourning into dancing. Do you see that? That's huge. That's huge. It's, that, that is the key to, the, to, the, to what is taking place in our pain and in our suffering. That He joins into that mourning and He reveals to us, that's the metanoia piece of what is really going on because He takes those thoughts of death. Because that's why we want to stay away from sadness and sorrow. As I talked about last time, we're always doomsday prepping for the heart. Right? We're always doomsday prepping. And so I got to set up my defenses. I got to prepare for the end. It's coming. It's coming. And what he's saying is bring the sorrow, 
bring the grief. It's safe. The sadness, it's safe. You can go there. And I've been realizing this because I haven't been comfortable with that. I haven't been comfortable with being sad. Never, re never really able to do that, especially being the funny guy, right? Being the funny guy, trying to be the life of the party or whatever that might be. Sadness, I, didn't, I don't do sadness well. <laughs> and what I'm learning is like, whoa, there is a treasure here uh, in those emotions um, that Jesus literally is seated at the edge of the bed. And he's also seated at the right hand of the Father. So who's all in the room? Oh, come on. Do you yeah, see what I mean? Man. Everybody's in the, the, the whole family's here. The whole family's here. And there's something that we're meant to discover in that pain that is a treasure for the purpose of, of, of healing, of healing those deep wounds that either came to us through our parents or through others or, or, or uh, decisions that we've made. And so that affirmation is is so is so valuable and you you see it because i go back to that question of of if i'm in christ why do i still feel all this right just take it away isn't that what it's all about isn't that what salvation is all about the swoop down superhero takes us out of the situation we're going to hell and then he comes and saves us at the last minute you see how it works into every aspect of our lives on how we see it? So we know and we've discovered as a community of believers that we understand that salvation and what Jesus has done is, is, is He's accomplished adoption. He's included us in the life that the Father, Son, and Spirit share. That means everything that Jesus shares in His relationship with the Father has been given to us. We have access to it. You know what I mean? And so us guys, you know, you come, you're at home and dad comes home from work. You stand up real quick, right? Got to act like you're working. Can't be sitting, seating, seated down, uh, seated down. Instead, we have this father that adores us and loves us. And his good pleasure is to teach us everything that we're meant to know about ourselves. And then being able to take that into relationship. You see, those painful feelings, if we were not meant to glean from those, then there is a, there is a mix-up in, in the whole thing. We're, we're being sucked out of reality and placed in this weird in-between Gnostic thing instead of getting settled right here, like settle down right in the dirt and understand that that is where He meets us. He doesn't meet us in the in-between. He meets yeah. us in the here. We keep, keep trying to go up you know, we keep trying to get some lofty vision or lofty idea of how this works. If I can just get taller or taller or taller, right? I'm a short guy. You know what I mean? If I can stand a little bit taller, I'll be able to enjoy, you know, whatever it is. And that's not the reality. He's joined us right where we are at. And I will say that I have learned so much from being okay to be sad. It's okay to be sad. That's the message today. It's a bummer of a message, but it's okay. <laughs> it, it really is. It really is. You begin to see the truth of who you really are, the truth of what you've really been through. That is Jesus joining our history. Let him join the history. Let it allow, to allow ourselves to, to see where he was at in the wounds, right? That he was present, that he's always been present that he understands exactly how we feel and he joins us in that feeling. And what I, you have that scripture, it says to mourn with those who mourn. Yeah. Now that will blow your mind. They say the, the most powerful, the most powerful thing against bitterness, against resentment is empathy. They said it is like a powerhouse. And empathy is not only seeing what has happened that was wrong, but how it made someone feel. See, we, we could sit here and play legalistic all day long, right? This shouldn't have happened. This should happen. But how it actually affected you, that is the heart of the gospel, right? It's not about just deciding these things went wrong in life. Now that I see them, I can do better, right? I, I, I made these mistakes, and now if I just do, I won't do those anymore. But to actually climb inside the feelings 
that those 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 uh, decisions and those problems have created. You see, I've I uh, understanding, especially with girls. I live in a house full of girls, um, so emotions are big. Uh, I'm in a what do you call it? A um, ocean of estrogen a lot of times, and that is has taught me so much in being under not only understanding that something bad has happened, but to actually go understand how that makes a person feel. That, that's so valuable. I've never really understood that. And so that's why that sadness is valuable, because it's that affirmation that this shouldn't have happened. That you didn't deserve that. It was wrong. It was wrong. And in Jesus, that's what takes place. He is the affirmation of everything that we are, every part of our life. Um, I, uh, I've gained a lot of knowledge. I'll say I don't want to ever go through learning it again, but the value of being able to recognize that there, that, that sadness is okay, that sorrow is okay. Because it's a, when it's according to the will of God, that sorrow begins to change our perspective. Mm-hmm. And you think you know love? <laughs> I thought I knew it. I thought I understood love. I'm like, okay, this is a good level. I think I got it down. It just gets better. It gets better and better and better. That's what blows my mind. Yeah. You never tap, it's, it's a, a continual, yeah, it's an artesian well that just continues to bubble up. And it's like, as soon as you think you, you know the depths of it, you discover something that just blows all of that out of the water, so to speak. And you begin to discover more and more and more. And, um, and so walking through it, we just use the scripture, uh, the valley of the shadow of death. Um, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, I remember growing up, I thought that they were saying, like, I I didn't want the shepherd, but that's not what I was saying. I really did. I was like, that's a, why do people keep using that scripture? Um, But walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Um, The Old Testament, we're living in a new creation, a new testament. Thou art with me. And it's, in, it's incredible to begin to understand um, that it's not a zapping thing. I grew up very charismatic, very charismatic. Everything was zap it away, you know what I mean? And going through things that you can't just zap away changes your perspective on the whole of the gospel. And that doesn't mean that there's not miracles. That doesn't mean that there's been circumstances and situations where people have been this close to suicide, where there's been a miracle take place. I fully believe in those things. But what happens when you're zapped, or if you were zapped, something is lost that is very valuable. You. If it's just a programming of your mind, if it's just a zapping, I'm going to make you a little Jesus, then, they, then the Trinity loses what they love it so much and they desire so much is you, you and I. But that transformation, that life of turning that mourning into dancing is so beautiful and it can be painful and we can trip and we can get the dance moves wrong or feel as though we're getting the dance moves wrong. But then all of a sudden, it's the most beautiful dance because it's created, it's, it's turning that mourning into something. It's going somewhere. And that is what I've been discovering, not only in my own life, but just watching and looking at the mourning that I've caused others. Because sometimes you begin to discover that, and the enemy or the darkness creates regret, Right? It creates condemnation and shame, shame that'll just destroy you. And so now I have shame. I have to fight the shame. So what do we do? We have to be, we have to find pride, right? Pride is, you know what I mean? There's always a root, the root of pride. You you see that shame. I am not who I should be, but I'm going to prove that I can exist. I'm going to prove that I'm somebody that has worth. 
And at the very heart of it, getting down to the, to, to the, to the roots of all of that, there's the, there's the need for affirmation of the wounds, of the pain, because in that, there's healing. There's, you can't have healing unless there's a wound, right? Unless we affirm that there's a wound. We talked about that last time with the, um, how the early church saw the physician, the great physician. Um, it's like, get down on the surgery table, and I don't want to sit there on the table. I'm tired of being on the table. But the, the early church, and we said it last time, is removing the Holy Spirit is removing everything that's contrary to the nature of you, the nature of who you were created to be, and how that is removing the things that are not of love's kind. And that is the sweetness of the Holy Spirit, and it hurts sometimes. And it's okay. You're going to be okay. Yeah. We're going to be okay. Yeah. As he turns that morning uh, into dancing. Um, so that's what I uh, wanted to share this morning. Uh, and it's, it's <laughs> there's, something, there's something extraordinary about those deep feelings that I really, I've had sadness over here, right? Like I was talking about, I had a circle for sadness to sit in yeah. and leaving Clint behind essentially because mm -hmm. Clint wasn't able to be sad. Clint wasn't able to go there. Yeah. And you carry on life and the pe like I said, the people that you love are going, I see that you are clearly bleeding out. There's a trail of blood behind you. You don't see it. You're numb to it. Everything's going to be okay. Everything is okay. Everything's okay. And not being able to be sad led, has led me in the past to those positions of, of being in denial of what is real. And therefore having that grace that is sufficient for what's real it's like I don't have I don't have the grace to be over here in La La Land or in, in this place of it's not real. And getting into the reality, it's okay, it's safe. That's really it. You are safe. I am safe to go there. And I know it's scary. It's very scary sometimes. It feels overwhelming. And uh, but that is the call of the Holy Spirit to lead us to those places of healing, those deep wounds that you know are there and the Holy Spirit will bring to our mind one at a time, be able to go there and watch that morning be turned into dancing. It is radical. Yeah. It is radical. It's unreal. Um, and that's what I wanted to share this morning. It's a short one. Uh, I uh, love you all so much. And I always talk about it's so cool that the body of Christ is a real thing. Yeah. It's, it's not just a club. It's, it's, uh, and so to see all the family in town, and all the, the family out of town or all over town or all over the world. Um, it's amazing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you that you're safe, that yes. you're a safe daddy. Yes. I thank you that we could be ourselves no matter how messy that looks. Mm -hmm. I thank you that, that you produce that freedom, that freedom to be ourselves, that freedom to come to you. And I ask you, Lord, that you open the eyes of our understanding of you in us and what you are shepherding, shepherding us into and shepherding us out of. I thank you that you lead us. I thank you that you, you are the one that creates that peace in the midst of our real life. Allow us to be grounded in reality and who you are. That we do not mourn as other mourn. We don't mourn as the world mourns. I ask you, Lord, to continue to turn our mourning into dancing. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for the perichoresis of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Teach us to dance. <laughs> Teach us to dance in it. Lord Jesus, amen. Yeah.